You know how rain enhances the smell of earth? I think it does the same thing to light in photographs, but as well enhances the light already present, reflecting, doubling, abstracting it. It's an effect filmmakers appreciate and create using a wet down on streets for an atmospheric touch. Add a foggy window and the lights bleed and blend like paint until you're left with just color, just emotion. Saul later understood the appeal and captured rainy days in New York City for decades. His long career as both a photographer and painter saw him through exhibiting at the Museum of Modern Art and also periods of struggling to pay his bills. However, a wave of interest in his work with the publication of his 2006 book, Early Color, has cemented his legacy as a pioneer in color photography. The lighter himself was generally unconcerned with legacy or fame, saying, I embrace my unimportance. And he seemed baffled by the public's curiosity into his life and artistic process, maintaining that he doesn't know why he did the things he did. So, at the risk of over-intellectualizing what lighter rays felt instinctively, let's talk about photography, art, and color. So much of the time, we consider good photographs to be the ones that are immediately striking. They tell a story through the specifics, they have razor-sharp focus, they follow our creatively bend composition techniques. And when it comes to street photography, like all genres of photography, it has traditional stylistic hallmarks. Dramatic shadows on noir figures, geometric forms, deep depth of field shot in contrasty black and white with 35mm lenses. But Leiter said, I like taking photographs that sometimes you don't know what's going on. Photographs that don't hit you over the head. Hence, the rain. Rain and umbrellas may be staples in street photography now, and I'm sure people have always romanticized the rain. But Leiter was using rain to create atmosphere and abstraction in images as early as 1950, and more in the effects of that abstraction later. For now, you know it's likely a lighter if there's some obscuring element, umbrella, snow, condensation, that prevent a clear view of the subject, if there's a subject at all. And the obscuring element is not just weather, but also glass, mirrors, or the framing and focus itself. Reflections in glass create textures that look like light leaks or double exposures, and reflections in mirrors create montages. Per usual lighter style, we only get fragments of these three subjects, but they look like they're on three different planes of existence. A cool toned concrete city on the left, a warm sunny storefront, apparently in inverse France, and the darkly lit man in our dimension. Lighter likely framed his camera and waited, maybe taking several versions to get this shot where the people and environment line up just to his liking. We know from his contact sheets and just a huge volume of archives that he was prolific, shooting entire rolls of film of just one moment. He seemed to treat photography as a process of discovery and worked with the unpredictability of strangers in the streets. The same sensibilities are seen in his fashion photography, a field he worked in for almost 20 years, mostly through his job at Harper's Bazaar starting in 1957. When asked if he saw his fashion work as separate from his personal photography, he said, I didn't separate anything. Sometimes they overlapped. My photographs in fashion were probably uh, related in some way to personal things. He disregarded boundaries of genre by bringing fashion out into the flow of the street, rather than in a controlled studio. You still see all his stylistic trademarks like shooting through windows, abstract shapes of color, this beautiful use of negative space. While the point is ostensibly to showcase the clothes, this model is tucked away in the bottom left, face hidden by a parasol. Lighter's not just focused on selling the dress, he's building a tropical atmosphere. With all these touches of obscuration, you'd expect the composition to be messy or just boring, aimless mush. But Leiter searched for order and control in the mishmashy confusion. There's balance here, imparted to having a focal point. There are a ton of ways to compose focal points, like separating the in-focus subject from the blurred background, placement of the subject, brightness, colors, patterns, and breaking them. And importantly, people are good at recognizing people. So even the smallest suggestion of a human figure anywhere in the frame catches our attention and grounds the image into something familiar. The anonymity, too, lends to universality and timelessness. Well, as timeless as a relatively new medium can be, but instead of this becoming a portrait of this man in all specificity, it just becomes a photo of a man. As opposed to images that emphasize narrative, disguised identities put mood front and center. In terms of mood, the effect of all this abstraction is a sometimes somber, sometimes mysterious, dreamy atmosphere, but always shot through with a romanticism, and no small part due to the actual content Leiter was drawn to shoot, like Soames Bantry, a fellow artist and Leiter's longtime romantic partner, or a Parisian cafe, a kissing couple, a Venetian gondola, drizzly weather. 
a chaotic city calmed, taking a breath in the rain. That being said, writer and philosopher Susan Sontag points out that photographs inherently romanticize the past because they captured things and people long gone, saying a beautiful subject can be the object of rueful feelings because it has aged or decayed or no longer exists. All photographs are memento mori. To take a photograph is to participate in another person or thing's mortality, vulnerability, mutability. Precisely by slicing out this moment and freezing it, all photographs testify to time's relentless melt. And what we point a camera at, even if it's not beautiful, is meaningful to at least one person. So maybe these photos only seem romantic to us because of the bygone people and hats and cars and streets. But I think Leiter's abstract style is just as important to the mood and works in tandem with the substance. His more recent work before his death in 2013 is less readily available online, but you can still see him in this one from around 2004. And the decades of images prove that Leiter didn't have to travel far to find beauty. Rather, he found and created it in his everyday life while photographing his own neighborhood of East Village for 60 years. You can tell from the littering on the window that these were taken at the same place. Whether it's a street scene or a simple detail, he seemed to repeatedly find new ways to appreciate them in a signature style. So abstraction and ambiguity give us this different way of looking at our everyday lives. But I think it also makes color the point. I wouldn't say Leiter's black and white photos are identical in style to the color ones, but they do rhyme. In this early work, he establishes his way of selectively showing and hiding, but we also get a more straightforward, clear view of his subjects, maybe because of the personal nature of these images of his family, friends, and fellow artists. But as Leiter says, the history of art is a history of color, and as beautiful as his black and white work is, Leiter is known for color, and the color was shaped by his tools. He shot on many cameras, mostly a Leica, and many types of film, mostly Kodachrome, a side film known for its vibrant colors, especially the reds. But because color film and especially positive slide film is more expensive than black and white negatives, Leiter often used expired film. Though to be clear, he shot boxes and boxes of negatives too. Given the premium, if he developed the film at all, he only developed projectable slides rather than prints. In part due to the old film, in part due to Leiter's disdain for perfection, images are full of film artifacts like visible grain and scratches, and reddish halation in the glowing edge of the windows. Colors are faded, leaning sepia, or a touch green, or magenta. This swipe of yellow across the top is from the end of the film accidentally getting exposed to light. Again, Sontag points out signs of age only add to a photograph's charm, saying photographs when they get scrofulous, tarnished, stained, cracked, faded, still look good, do often look better, Leiter's painterly quality and subjective perspective has drawn comparisons to Impressionism, Neo-Impressionism, even Cubism. But no art movement has defined Leiter's art and photography more than abstract expressionism. His first love was actually art. As a teenager, he read widely on art history and taught himself how to paint, and these are actually his paintings. They have even more vibrant and fluorescent colors than his photos. Leiter was studying to become a rabbi like his father, but left theology school for New York where he fell into art, then photography, through his friend and abstract expressionist artist, Richard Bissett Dart. Abstract expressionism is, um, these. Abstract meaning without representational forms, expression is a meaning and expression of emotional and human experience, an inner emotional, even subconscious truth, rather than a naturalistic one. Out of this movement of post-war Laura Manhattan artists, I think the most relevant to Leiter's photography is a branch called color field painting. Specifically, Mark Rothko and his use of red and black. If the dynamic movement of action paintings is improv jazz, Rothko's huge, mesmerizing fields of color is a hum that slowly grows louder until it drowns out everything else. In front of the massive canvases, viewers have reacted with tears, maybe more than have with any other painting. Because it's not just a couple rectangles of color, Rothko painted layers and layers of thin paint and sometimes blurred them with cloth, developing undertones and depth with a luminous breathing quality. Transitions between the floating color fields are soft and organic. As art philosopher Dr. Hans Mays puts it, it's like being confronted with a vast seascape. No focal point, no hard edges to grasp as it engulfs you. It engages you in a journey of emotions, some beyond words, Maybe you feel the deep red as an opiate, wine, passion, enticing you in. The darker red is intention with a scarlet, a red that's more urgent, volatile, a herald of danger, destruction. 
lifeblood, but also death. Starting in the late 1950s, Rothko's palettes grew darker. Black glare of both maroon, black plum, black gray. Tensions of despair and peace, decay and relief. These color emotions bring a new layer of context to this, the almost oppressive blocks of maroon and blue-black, like the time before and after the silver sliver of life. Leiter often used a long-focus telephoto lens that compresses distance for this flat effect and also turns anything out of focus into unrecognizable brushstrokes of blurry color. If we blur this even more, you can better see the balance between colors and subject and just how boldly he used negative space. In fact, the colors are the subject. Red demands to be seen and appears again and again in Leiter's work, sometimes as an urgent accent. There never was a red umbrella he didn't like, but sometimes as a wash of color, saturating and filling the frame. This is one of his most popular images, and the eye bounces around as it takes a second to work out what you're seeing. The driver and passenger are supporting characters to all the red, the shiny red of the taxi, the brick red of the wall, and its reflection in the foreground surface that adds depth. The red of afternoon warmth, a departure from Leiter's reign. Now Leiter did not see his art and photography as connected, but art movements and photography have always informed one another in a giant cultural soup. To put it broadly, with the rise of photography in the mid to late 19th century, Impressionists weren't as interested in competing for photographic realism as much as an impression of a scene in its fleeting light as filtered through subjective perspective and feelings. Impressionism in turn informed the soft light and pictorialist photographs and proceeded to increasing subjectivity and emotional intensity from German Expressionists. Then, through a synthesis of modern art influences including German Expressionism, Surrealism, and Abstract Art, we get Abstract Expressionism including abstract expressionist photographers like Aaron Siskind, and somewhere in the spectrum of painters and photographers, Saul Leiter. Then it's interesting that a lot of people are confused by abstract art, unsure of what they're supposed to feel, or they're even offended by its seeming simplicity and skeptical of any deeper meaning. But this, this we understand. We don't wonder what we're supposed to feel, we just do. Maybe because even if we're not sure what it's depicting, a photograph is inherently grounded in reality. Maybe because photography is more accessible. Most of us have taken out of focus photos. We've looked at the world through reflections in glass, hazy car windows, tired eyes. We know the smell of rain, 